start to put tension on my string drawback, I was like, okay, I'm going to It's him. You can look at the horns when he's dead. I'm, I'm in, you know, in the zone. Let the arrow go. It's perfect. Uh, so they lose their front drawers. Yeah, you start. Yeah, that's how you know. Went about five, ten more yards. He probably went 20 yards. He stepped down to try to get back up. I saw him fall up. We rushed for a few rods that night. We got like 156 in front of like that. And then the next day, we came up to 153 even. You're listening to the White Cat Outdoors podcast, bringing you to the table where we talk about the outdoors. What's going on, everybody? This is episode 65 of the White Cat Outdoors podcast. And uh, it's St. Patty's Day, so happy St. Patty's Day to everybody. When you're listening to it, it won't be anymore, but I hope you had a good one, and I hope everyone was safe. and Had, had a couple, some green beer. I was just going to say, had oh, a couple sorry. of green beers. You, you stole my thunder. Yikes. But, yeah. We're probably going to go have a green beer or two after this. Absolutely, yeah. Tom an Irish to, car bomb. I'm not going to have that. Tom and I'll have an Irish car bomb. You guys, Tom can have two. One, one for him, one for me. Deal. Deal. Delicious. Delicious. Never had one. They're not delicious. Guinness and Bailey's, and I think Jameson, right? I, I don't even know. I know it, it tastes gross. But you know what else comes in a green bottle that doesn't taste gross? What? Jaeger. That's also gross. No. Yeah, very gross. We won't drink that either. Well, we might. Eh, we probably won't. Tom might. <laughs> <laughs> Tom's definitely going to. But enough, enough St. Patty's Day talk. Uh, but what else is close to St. Patty's Day? Uh, turkey hunting. Turkey hunting. So it's getting started up. Actually, some states down south, they're getting dang close to being going already. Yeah, I don't think anyone's. Yeah, going I'm yet, saying, but it's but parts it, of Florida are the first to open up, and I know they're usually right around the first part or the first week of May. Or I'm sorry, first that's, week of March. <laughs> so that's not even close. Yeah, I think no, they first are. week of March. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if they're open yet. I didn't look into it because I'm not turkey hunting Florida this year, but there's a good chance they're already open. Yeah. Yeah. So we're gonna talk turkey today. Yeah, and actually, this one, this podcast is going to be driven by the listeners. Yeah. Um, Finally, you guys have been listening to us saying, leave it in the comments and that sort of shit. Yeah. And you I have actually, left it in the comments. I was impressed. Um, typically, we get like one response, and you guys are really stepping it up. You know, we got several things to cover tonight. Um, so, before we get into turkey hunting, I just want to remind everybody that we launched our Patreon account, and the first 20 people that join are getting in for a $500 mobile setup giveaway. Um, that's insane. It's five bucks a month and for a one in 20 chance. Yeah. It, I don't even see why you wouldn't join. Uh, spots are filling up already and you're going to want to get in there soon. Yeah. Just so go sign up. It's going to be sure. wild. So, uh, I will go ahead and get Let's into get the, this ball rolling. Yeah. I was going to think if I had something clever to say about turkeys, about, like, get the ball rolling, but... It's not it's not clever anymore if no, it's taken it's not. this long. Um, so, we're going to fire off in order. So, thank the people that went first. Um, you know, we're just going to kind of go down the line. Um, some will be answered quicker than others, but I think some other ones are going to drive some really good uh, conversation. So, stay uh, tuned. Yeah. You're going to want to listen in. First one is going to be a quick one, uh, and we're going to go right to Tom because this one was Tom-specific. Um, comes from our buddy old Kay Sharpie. Um, oh, he's been on the podcast. Uh, we've done some out-of-state turkey hunts with him, um, hunted in uh, his home state of New York with him in the past. Um, had a lot of good times turkey hunting with him. And he asks, um, Tom, does your mustache bring you more success in the turkey woods? <laughs> Short answer, yes. 100%. It's, it's, I don't know how to describe it, but when I'm out there in the turkey woods, Keith, and I know a gobbler's close, it, it starts to tingle. Like it's, it's like a sixth or maybe seventh sense. I'm not sure. Do you have to like rub it to keep it calm? While... Yeah. Yeah. Or else it just starts going everywhere. But yeah. And I think it's also like an intimidation factor. Like I go out there. And your beard's bigger than the birds. Well, no, I can't grow a beard. 
But the mustache. But my mustache is bigger than theirs. It, the, they, his the mustache is shaped more like a turkey beard anyway. Like a human beard's not shaped like a turkey beard. That's true. Yeah, but it's not like intimidating. The intimidation's a bad word. It it makes me feel dangerous when I'm yeah. going out in the woods. Like I go out there and I'm like, yeah, I'm one with these woods. These birds aren't going to know what hit them. So yes, Keith, my mustache does bring me success in the turkey woods and. When I am successful in smoke a big gobbler, it looks great in pictures. It does look It's true. Really, it's very photogenic. Yeah. You have a great mustache, Tom. Thank you. So thanks, Keith. <laughs> uh, the next one I think is going to drive a lot more conversation around the table. Um, and it comes from James Laird, 25, which um, we all know James. Yeah. But uh, his dad's the one that made us our South Hill bat, um, shot bat that we used, branded with White Cat Outdoors. Um, and he wants to know, uh, where to be set up on turkeys for different weather conditions. Um, and I've had success a few times in rain. Um, so I guess I'll start with that. Um, and then we'll let Tom and Frank cover more fair weather conditions. Um, cause turkey hunting in the rain can be difficult, um, because the birds tend to be a little bit more quiet and it's just, it's seen, well, one, it sucks to sit in the rain all day. Um, Definitely. But if you want to kill turkeys, the rain is, um, it, it's still a good time to get out there and do it. It just changes up your tactics a little bit. Um, yeah, that's the thing about turkeys. Like, with deer, when the weather's shitty, like, they hunker down, they don't do anything. Turkeys are more apt to move around in inclement weather. They're just, it's just their nature. They don't yeah. sit still all day and like, oh, the weather sucks, we're just going to hang out. And yeah. when you're turkey hunting, you're shooting them in the head with a shotgun. So you don't have to worry about tracking and losing a blood trail yeah. in the rain. Yeah. yeah. So back to rainy situations, James. Um, for me, it's worked two different times in the rain for me. And basically what you want to do is get to large openings um, or a field is your easiest large opening. But if you're in large areas of timber, if you can find a big opening, um, that's where I've found my best luck on turkeys because for two reasons. One, they're trying to dry their feathers out, and they're in those big open areas. They can get a little bit more wind, possible sunshine or something to help dry out the feathers. But the biggest reason I think it is, is um, the uh, factor with like with all the rain coming down, it's really hard for them to hear, and so they can't hear things like creeping up on them in the woods. And I think that's a big factor of why they want to be out in a field or an open area where they can see a long distance. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but that's my reasoning behind it. And like I said, it's worked for me to sit field edges or small openings in the timber, uh, like little, uh, Creek bottoms that don't have much, um, trees in it. Like we've got a stretch that's probably, you know, 60 yards wide by maybe 150 yards long of like this Creek bottom that there's not a whole lot of trees in. And that's where I killed, uh, pretty good bird in a few years back in the rain. And then the other one was on a field edge. So mm -hmm. open areas for sure in the rain. One thing I want to touch up on real quick, it's very similar to this. Uh, if you're hunting and it's raining and you know that shortly the rain is going to stop and the sun is going to come out, then you need to get to a field edge quick because as soon as that rain stops and the sun comes out, all the birds are going to be going to fields to, like Nick said, dry their feathers off. Mm -hmm. So if it's, if it's a downpour and you know that at 9.30 the rain's supposed to let up and the sun's coming out, you want to be on that field edge before the sun comes out. So I know you've had good, we've all had good luck in fair weather. That's, I think, the best time to kill turkeys. Not only because they, I think it's just more hunters hunt when it's, nice weather and i think that's why more turkeys get killed i and don't like really... you said they're more vocal when the weather's nice with yeah. it's raining and crappy well, and, they're quieter. and like a crisp morning you know sun shining there's no wind you can hear that bird going for yeah. a couple hundred yards mm -hmm. um and then i know well, i'll throw it back to tom because i know he's probably you had some success like just in the fair weather stuff i guess instead of i typically sit inside the timber where you're better on field edges it seems and have had more luck than i have so basically i'm trying to think weather um fair weather i would say cold is better to an extent 
Um, if you have a nice, brisk, cold morning, clear, not a lot of wind, uh, it seems like those birds really light up on the roost. And that's when I try and hunt the roost where, you know, I know where the birds are going to fly down and pitch into their strut zones rather than pitch down and go right up to a field where they can see. So if it's a nice clear morning where they're not worried about hearing or anything, um, then I typically, I try and hunt those strut zones where I think they're going to pitch down off the roost and hang out into the woods for a little bit, maybe meet up with a hen before they work their way up to a field. Just a quick uh, tip on getting into those strut zones. This is a little off topic from that, but make sure you guys are putting birds to bed the night before you're hunting. Mm -hmm. I can't stress how important that is to success of killing turkeys. Um, I was just going to say that too. If you put them to bed the night before, you know the exact tree they're going to be in. And if you see that there's going to be that clear morning, like Tom said, you can get right in on them. I've also, I haven't, it hasn't worked for me. Um, But another thing you can do if it is raining, if you put them to bed the night before, you're, it's a lot easier to sneak in on them because it's yeah. going to be dead silent coming through the woods. Mm-hmm. So that's not a bad tactic to set up on in those strut zones for rainy conditions. But if you are hunting in an area that you can't put birds to bed, um, stay on the field edges for snow. Or, I mean, for rain. Yeah. Another reason why it's good to put birds to bed when you're hunting those strut zones is those strut zones usually aren't terribly far away from where they're roosting. They're not going to roost here and then on the complete other side of the block, they're going to go strut. Like those are usually aren't very far away. Exactly. So when you put them to bed, you can set up near those strut zones and bring them in. Cause they want to hook up with the hens as quick as possible. They don't want to. And you want to sound like the sexiest hen on that side of the ridge. Exactly. So, so set, just, go ahead. I was just going to clarify what we mean when we're talking strut zones. Um, so the best way to put it in, in your ideal situation, you would have a nice, big hillside um, and typically if there is a big hillside that's where the birds are going to be roosting because when they fly down they can pitch towards the hill and they don't have they can almost fly straight out of the tree and hit you know the hillside without dropping down a fair amount and the strut zone typically is going to be at the bottom of that hill and like a or the top in a big typically they're open hardwoods maybe with some like grassy bottoms or ferns or stuff like that places where they can see a long distance but they still have the cover of the hardwood so oak flats are great strut zones for gobblers and you know there's acorns in there for them to eat as well but yeah they just big open timber with a lot of grassy bottoms and ferns and stuff like that make great strut zones for gobblers or if they're where they're roosting isn't far away from like a field edge. Yeah. They'll go out into the field. Yeah. Edges. I've seen a lot of birds pitch right down into a field. Yeah. Like yeah. if your hillside, you know, starts at the edge of a field, a lot of times, yeah, they'll just, they pitch right down into the field, which we've seen that a lot in Kansas, but that kind of makes it tough. You got to get in super early or if you're going to be walking through the middle of the field, trying and you know, get in there well before light and use as much cover as you can and make as little sound as possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So to summarize this up for James, it's for, I guess in our experience, weather doesn't play a huge factor in setups, um, but it definitely, um, there's, I guess it's, it's, it's part of the equation, um, but don't let weather deter you from hunting or if you don't have field edges, don't think that you can't get out there in the rain and hunt them. And mm-hmm. same thing with fair weather. Yeah, a lot of times people will get impatient when hunting in the rain because a lot of times... I am people. Yes, Nick I am is. also people. <laughs> a lot of times, you know, typically birds will pitch down, I mean, in our area around 6.15 to 6.30, um, you know, just before light. And that's about 6.15 in our mm-hmm. in our area. Hunting in the rain, I've had birds stay up in the tree until 8 o'clock without making a sound. So just because you don't hear them gobbling on the roost doesn't mean they're not there. But it seems like if you are having a rainy morning and, you know, the birds, they stay up into the tree until 8.30 or so, when they come down, they're rearing to go and make a lot of noise. And thunder makes them shot gobble. Helps to locate them. Yeah, so if it's a thunderstorm and you hear some thunder rolling, keep an ear out because a lot of times it's going to make the birds gobble. Yep. 
So on to the next one, uh, Mr. Kevin underscore Berkeley 15. Uh, he asks, dealing with quiet lit birds when they hit the ground, what are we doing to stay on those birds or kill them? Uh, I'm not the strongest caller, so I'm going to turn the uh, attention over to somebody that calls better than I am, which Tom does a lot better with his calling. So one of the easiest times to get a bird to gobble is where when they're on the roost. And it's I've I'm guilty of this. I recently switched this tactic uh last year and noticed a great difference in this. Actually I switched sorry, I'm sorry, two years ago I switched this tactic and noticed a great difference. But prior I'd hear a bird gobble on the roost and I'd break out my call and call right back mm-hmm. and the whole ridge lights up and you're like, Oh man, this is awesome. So Two minutes later, you call again, and the whole ridge lights up. And you're like, okay, these birds, they're hot. They're coming right in. And then they hit the ground and shut up. And you're like, what the hell just happened? And in the turkey world, when a bird gobbles on the roost and a hen responds, in his mind, that hen is supposed to come to him. And he will stay in the tree until that hen is pitched down and walks underneath him. And then when he sees that hen that's been calling to him, then he'll pitch down and link up with his hen. So what I've found works much better. It's very challenging to do. I told myself for years this is what I was going to do, and it took me about three years of saying it before I actually started applying it. On the roost, I don't call. and I just let the birds do their natural thing, and when the birds... When I, you can t- tell the difference of when they're gobbling in a tree versus when they fly down and they're gobbling on the ground. If you get close enough, you can actually hear them fly down, which is pretty cool. But when they're gobbling in a tree, they sound like they're right on top of you. And when they fly down, they're a little bit more muffled and sound quite a bit further away. Mm-hmm. And what I've been doing is I wait until they fly down and then I just let out just some soft yelps and clucks, just nothing too exciting, just to let the birds know, hey, I'm over in this area. And I've had birds come in without even making a sound. They just know, hey, there's a hen over there. I'm going to go try and hook up with her. And they'll do, they come in and they'll start strutting out at 40 yards and work their way in. But I think one of the biggest mistakes you can make is calling early on the roost because then they think the birds or the hen is going to fly to them. And I think what your question was asking is more like that first hour of the light or after light, after the birds fly down, it seems like you call and they hammer back, but they're not getting any closer. And then all of a sudden they shut up. I think it's because they're already henned up. Yeah. I typically think that's when they're, they already got henned up because the advantage the real hens have is they can go to the gobbler and that's how it naturally works while turkey hunting i was just gonna say a lot of people don't know that like people that do turkey hunt a lot don't know that that's how turkeys work yeah because the way you're you know everybody hunts is i bring the gobbler to the hen yeah but in the turkey world that's totally opposite when you're already you have the deck the deck stacked against you because you're trying to get that turkey to do something that it does not do every day yeah the hen is supposed to go to the gobbler so it's unnatural for the gobbler to come to the hen so usually you know birds are super vocal in the morning and then they get henned up and shut up and i don't have any magic tricks to solving that problem my only input is uh walking and calling uh try and find a gobbler that missed that first light opportunity at a hen and it's looking for love. And I have noticed if you can get a gobbler to light up, you know, after that first hour, you're a lot more apt to call them in because they know they missed out on their boat and now they're eager to try and link up with another hen. Mm -hmm. I think another mistake that a lot of people make is they call, they get an answer. They call, they get an answer. They call, no answer. They call, no answer. They A lot of people overcall. If you call and get an answer, he knows you're there. Mm-hmm. He heard you. He knows exactly where you are. 
you don't have to call again right away. He is fully aware of what's going on. And if you just shut up and be quiet for a while, the next time you let out a call, whether it's, you know, 10, 15 minutes later, unless he gets hand up, of course, he'll probably be closer. And a lot of times you'll get a gobble if you don't answer. He'll hammer back like, all right, you know, I heard you. Where are you at? I'm, I want to come to you. And if you don't say anything, they'll probably hammer again. Mm-hmm. But if you keep calling to them, they're less apt to fire right up. If they're committed, you know, they, they're, they're less apt to talk when you're doing all the talking. Another yeah. thing is, and I've made this mistake a lot, you call and you hear a gobble 300 yards away. And then you move in another 100 yards and call again. Well, what you just told that bird was... You're committing. Then Yeah, I'm committing. I'm on my way. So then that's going to make that gobbler hang up because he thinks, you know, you're you're pursuing him. But another... Back to when you have birds hang up or shut up. What I've observed and what I've tried and what has worked with me is if you get a bird that... You know, you're calling to him, he's coming in, and then he hangs up. Instead of moving in on that bird, move away from the bird and then That's call. That's worked for us a couple times. Yeah, because if you, you know, that gobbler, if he answers, he's going to be around in that area. He might shut up, but he's going to be around. I think that's a good point to make that just because a gobbler is not answering you does not mean he's not interested. Yeah. Um, an old mature bird will stop gobbling but continue to work his way in. And I think you can, it's easier to overcall than it is to undercall. Mm-hmm. And you can definitely scare a mature bird away by overcalling. Right. Yeah. So if, if he gobbles and then stops gobbling and then you move in, you know, 50, 60 yards, now he thinks, okay, this hen's coming to me. I don't have to move in any further. Um, but what we've had success doing is if you got a bird that gets hung up or stops gobbling, if you actually go the opposite direction of the bird, in call, then he's going to think, oh, crap, I'm missing my opportunity. I better move in. So what we try to do is you're sitting in one spot calling. This bird's hung up at 150 yards. You move back away from the bird 100 yards in call. If he answers, then you want to move up 50 yards and sit down and don't make a sound mm-hmm. because that bird or that gobbler is going to think, oh, he, she's leaving. I need to head over there now. Yeah. And, you know, if you move up 50 yards from the last time you called, he's going to think that bird's 50 yards behind you, and mm-hmm. they're a lot less likely to get hung up that way, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So on to question three. Uh, this one comes from LL Eich 98 which is Lucas Eichner. Um, he for a two-parter. So first one is opinionated. Like, like it's asking for our opinion uh, and I'll give you that, which is the, is PA Turkey season too late in the year? Um, I personally, I don't think I've done enough research to give like a, uh, educated answer to it. But what I can say is I've killed birds opening weekend and I've killed birds at the end of the season. So I don't think it has too much of an effect on, uh, you're hunting. And I, I get what you're getting at is their mating season and the, the rest of the uh, states tend to open up earlier. Um, but I personally don't see, I, I, I guess my personal opinion, no, the season's not too late. It gives me an opportunity to go hunt other states like I'm doing this year before our season opens. So it's almost a bonus. So I know the, the actual turkey mating season is the end of March and throughout April, which we don't get to hunt until sometimes the last week of April. And then we get to hunt May, which is actually post-mating season. And I don't know what the Game Commission's thought process behind that is. Um, If I had to go out and guess, I would say that they want the turkeys to mate without being bothered so the hens can lay their eggs and I mean, because if you go out there during their mating season and start laying down gobblers, then, you know, there's going to be no gobblers to 
breed the hens. So I, I think it's a good idea to have the turkey season later. That way you give the hens a chance to lay their eggs and get an established nest to you know, protect. And I think it helps yield a better hatch that spring. And there's still plenty of action you know, in the month of May mm-hmm. where you can still vocalize with the turkeys and get them to come into a call. Yeah, I think that's people's biggest bitch with it is that it's like hunting the rut. It's easier to get a buck to come to you when he's horny and wants to find a doe. And I'm sure it's the same way with turkeys. If the turkey's mating, it's easier to get them to come to a hen when they haven't mated yet. After the mating season, they still do roughly the same thing, but they're not as hot to trot after the mating season. So I think that's people's biggest complaint is where it would be easier to get birds earlier during the mating season. But in my opinion, I don't think it's necessary. No, and I I think just as a side note, I think the lack of action that people see towards the end of the year isn't because the breeding season's over, but it's the pressure I agree. Uh, coming from other hunters. So I, I think it's more that. Especially than in it is. PA. Yeah. Um, but on to the second part of his question, which kind of goes into what I just said, and uh, how do we deal with uh, quiet birds after the first week? And I, I don't – that really depends on the property you're on. Definitely. Because if you have property that has low pressure – I don't have to deal with quiet birds after the first week. Now, I hunted Maryland a couple years ago, and we were there opening weekend, so the birds had zero pressure starting out. And some days they were quiet, and some days they weren't. And I think that has more to do with the weather and the barometric pressure. Um, I talked to a seasoned hunter down there um, that he – his name was Mark – from Hartford County, that's what he told us. But very, very seasoned <laughs> go, uh, turkey hunter. And I was talking to him, and he was looking at the weather, and he was telling me and Keith which days the birds would be gobbling that week while we were there based on his weather app. Mm-hmm. And he was spot on because, like, me and Sharpie wrote it down, and, like, the, when he said that they were going to gobble, they were going to gobble. And when they weren't, they weren't. And he had been hunting that area for a long time. He knew what weather did what to the birds. Um, he actually killed that week while we were down there. Mm -hmm. Um, so to answer your question, um, I think just shake things up and not put too much pressure on your property and you won't have the issues of, um, quiet birds. If you run into it, like say if you're on public land and you don't have control over the pressure, uh, I think introducing a decoy, just um, do something different, different different. yeah, do something different than what everybody else is doing. Yeah. Um, like there's not many guys that I know of that like Tom and I will, you know, back up 75 yards call and then run 60 yards closer. And Mm -hmm. like, it's just, it's off the wall and it works for us. We've had success doing it. It, You just gotta, you gotta trick the birds. You gotta be smarter than them. Their walnut brain holds a lot of info. And (laughs) it does. (laughs) um, Like I said, I think just switch things up, try something different and you'll get them to respond. Yeah, and sometimes trying something different is going to scare some birds away, but that's, how you that's just years <laughs> of trying different stuff. You'll figure out what does work, and hopefully you find something quicker rather than later. So what I was going to say is I think this what Nick was saying is how to prevent quiet birds after the first week is mixing things up. But what I want to go over is you know, if you are in a situation where the birds are pressured and they are quiet, I think the best way to attack that situation, if they're not responding, I think the best thing you can do is pattern those birds. Because mm-hmm. turkeys Back are... Back to locating them at night is what you're getting at? Not even that, just scouting the area. Them. If you know, yeah. okay, bur- turkeys are very patternable. Yeah. If you can... Yeah, they're even, pretty routine. If you can find out, you know where these birds come out into a field each morning. I mean, a lot of times you can set your clock to turkeys. Mm. You know, okay, at 7.15, these birds are going to come out into the field right here. So if I'm hunting, you know, a place where it's been pressured, it's what I what I would say is to maybe drop the calls and pursue them more like you would pursue a whitetail. Go in after, you know, their normal 
pattern set up on their travel corridors and you know try and hunt them that way try and set up in the spot that they're going to be in Mm -hmm. before they get there especially like our season the last couple weeks you can hunt afternoon so if you know about where they're going to be roosting you can move in on that in the evening and set up on that i think that's a better answer to his question tom so thank you for that i think we were talking like i said i was talking more preventing that from happening but in the event that it doesn't tom's answer yeah sometimes you just can't avoid it yeah yeah and Uh, another thing real quick before we move on is the late morning hunt if you got silent birds in the morning um wait until 10 o'clock a lot of times after 10 o'clock after the hens get back to their nest those gobblers are going to be out on the prowl again trying to find another hen so i've had a lot of success from 10 to noon that late morning Mm mm-hmm so our last question comes from our buddies over at Deers and Beers. Oh man, um, I was hoping they were going to say something. Yeah. they're they're actually they're they respond a lot, and I like they that. do. I enjoy those so, guys. I wish I was here for their podcast. It was a good one. Yeah, a lot yeah. of fun. Like, just have to do it again. I guess so. We'll see uh, if they're interested. I'm sure they will. Hopefully, if uh, you're listening to the podcast, Deers and Beers, and you hear this conversation, hit us up because we want you back on another episode. It'd be a good time. <laughs> So this one we're each going to have to kind of answer a little different, I think is the best way to do this. Um, and it, they're asking, for someone who's looking to get into the sport, what's your best advice? But you are not allowed to just to say, just have fun. Yeah, I'm um, not going to say did that. Did they say that? Or yeah, are you they, saying... they said, don't say, just have fun. So I guess I'll start uh, with my advice for the young turkey hunter. <laughs> That's an inside joke Frank gets. Uh, I don't. <laughs> wild man it, oh slamming and jamming tips baby. for the young hunter uh no, so if you're looking to get into turkey hunting um i think your the biggest piece of advice i can get a, give out to somebody that's getting into it uh get a turkey call months in advance practice your nuts off just practice that call and when you first get it just practice like i'm, I'm gonna stick to a mouth call because i think that's for me, the most effective because it requires the least amount of movement um, up close with birds and everything. And they're very versatile. Yeah, they very versatile. Yeah, it makes a lot of sounds. Uh, they're obviously, you can use them in the rain, unlike your friction calls um, that don't work in the rain. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to stick with mouth calls. So get yourself a mouth call. Start with something with probably two reeds. Um, that's not super vital. But when you first get it, just get comfortable with the call being in your mouth. Um, when you first start using a call, you're going to want to like almost gag or choke on it, which I, I, everybody sitting here, I know has had issues when you first start using a mouth call. So first get comfortable with it being in your mouth. Don't clip that. That could be, it could get dirty. (laughs) Uh, second, learn how to just make a noise with it. The most annoying screeches you can do with that call. Just get comfortable with making noises. After that, you start breaking apart the sounds of a turkey you know, with your yelps, you're, it's like a high note to a low note very quickly. Learn how to do the high note, learn how to do the low note, and then put them together. So for me, practice, practice, practice with your calls. And that's my that's my one tip, I mm-hmm. guess, for a new hunter. Yeah. I would say, like, if you're getting into turkey hunting, almost everybody knows several people that are way into turkey hunting. Even if you're not, like, close friends with them, like, you're going to go out hunting with them. Like, I know some people that literally just take people out hunting that they know, and they're very easy to talk to, and just go to those people that you know that go out turkey hunting, even if they're not overly successful. You just know people that have been out in the turkey woods, that have communicated with turkeys. Talk to them. See what they know, what they've seen, what they've heard, and start to apply it as you go out and see different things. So the first time you see something happen, it's not totally foreign to you. You can say, okay, I talked to this person and they told me that this is usually what happens in this situation. So just reading and talking to other people about... To get a manner pretty much. Not even, kind of. um, just, yeah. yeah. If, if you do have someone that can you can go out with and that's see a, that's them, a, yeah. how they work, I think that would be... I think that's a huge yeah. part of my success is being able to hunt with my grandfather and my dad yeah. and seeing their cadence for their calling yeah, and basically hearing what they're doing and then trying to 
mimic that sound mm -hmm. when I got home. Yeah. And then you'll find your comfort zone in that with what you find from other people. So combine talking to other people, reading, and your own experiences, and you'll progress a lot faster than if you just go out and try to learn everything on your own. That's a good point. Tommy? So real quick before I get into mine, I just want to briefly go back to what Nick said kind of about, you know, getting comfortable with a call. Um, but I think it's important to master two things before going out and turkey hunting, the cluck and the yelp. Those two sounds are 90% of what birds will be making out in the woods is clucking and yelping. If you can master those two sounds, you'll be able to call in a great majority of the birds. Mm -hmm. You don't need to get the fancy cutting, cackling, purring to call in most birds. You can call in most birds with just the simple cluck and the yelp. Yeah, so that, if you like see them moving around, like when you're deer hunting or if you're turkey hunting, if turkeys are constantly making noise. Yeah, if you're near a flock, they never stop making noise. They're constantly just, just light clucks. clucks all the time. So like you said, if you know that one call, you're communicating with them how they communicate 90% of the time. Yeah. So master the cluck and the yelp. And with those two things, you'll call in a lot of birds. But what I was going to say is the more land you can access to turkey hunt, the better. You can cover a hundred acre chunk of woods in... And I'm very quick. Yeah. Because when you're not having success, you know, right off the roost, and you know those birds that are hend up, the best thing to do in my opinion, is to walk and call. You walk 100 yards, call. If you don't get a response, walk another 100 yards and call. You kind of go after the birds, try and locate one, and you can cover ground very quickly. I, I think, honestly, like, and it's easy because anybody can do it, I think public land is some of the best tur turkey hunting because turkeys are in, I think, what, 49 of 50 states everywhere but Hawaii. Mm. Like I don't turkey. think they're in Alaska either. I'm not sure. I don't think. I've, ne I've never it, seen okay, one. Okay, so I know for 100% that they're in the 48 contiguous states. Yeah. Turkeys are everywhere. Um, they're on practically every piece of public land. And it gives, like Tom said, it gives you the, the ability to roam. Because even Tom and I have, uh, you know, a chunk that we hunt that's 85 acres. With two guys on that property hunting separately, it's toast in a day even like, on that 85 acres right on th off the roost odds are you're covering all the birds that are going to be on that 85 acres yeah there's there's likely not two f like th there may be two different groups of birds but they're going to meet up at some point yeah it, um, it's just how turkeys yeah, are they're so flock i would animals. think to piggyback on what tom said public land is probably your best friend for turkey hunting because the quality of birds does not change you know people will argue that you're going to have better deer and it's easier to control um on private land with deer, but I don't think turkeys that has anything to, mm -hmm. there's no merit to that. I think I agree. The only thing you might have more educated birds just because yeah. the number of people that go in and hunt them. But you know, we hunted a chunk of state land. It was what, like 15,000 acres or something in yeah. Maryland or Kansas. No PA. Yeah. That oh, was, yeah. It was Allegheny, Allegheny National Forest. Okay. Yeah. Part of Allegheny National Forest. Allegheny National Forest is much bigger than 14,000 acres. Yeah, but... no, that one contiguous piece of land. That's not in a word. The... Contiguous. Contiguous. Contiguous, same thing. Like, that's like something like, like, it's not like a word about like dinosaurs eating plants or something. Something like that. <laughs> There's a word that's similar to that. It's not. Anyway. Anyway, there was 15,000 consecutive acres that, and if on a chunk of land that big, you can get far enough away from the mm -hmm. typical was, crowd of guys that, was that opening goes weekend and we did not run into another guy right but yeah we're also four miles from the truck on our first setup right yeah you if you want you can easily because a lot of people they want to be within a few hundred yards of their truck so if you branch off and go a mile back into the woods there's a lot greater chance that you're gonna not Cro run into cross people. a creek that's another thing. Like, it doesn't even have to be distance. If you cross something that your average guy isn't going to cross with his regular hunting boots, you're into birds that nobody else is hunting. Like, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be distance. It's any deterrent of other hunters, whether it's distance, land features, 
I think there's a lot of people that are not willing to cross three ridges mm -hmm. to go hunt turkeys like we were doing in Maryland. Right. You know, there was a lot of guys hunting in Maryland when we were down there at Green Ridge. And as soon as you got two ridges off the road, it, you had the place to yourself. So yeah. I guess that's another tip. You're going to get four tips here. Um, so I have another one, too. Oh, geez. We're going to go five. That's oh, that's because we like Kyle and Ryan. Yeah. Uh, so I guess they my, get a little extra. My other tip would just be to put some sort of uh, deterrent between you and the other hunters, whether it's distance, terrain features, water, something, which that works for deer, too. But Tom, tip well, five. This is a two-parter. No, so that's like six tips. <laughs> So what I was going to say is one of the, I think, easiest ways to successfully kill gobblers is if you're on, you know, a piece of private land where you see birds come out into the field every morning at 730, go set up on those birds with a decoy and just, just call real soft. You don't have to make a whole lot of noise. Just let the birds do their natural thing. And I think that's one of the most easiest and effective ways to go about it and the other thing i was going to say was just have fun with it <laughs> <laughs> there you go <laughs> had to um i guess tip seven going back how to many the, tips are we doing this is here? a quick one back to the beginning um grow a mustache yeah there, that, there we yeah go. that will that will help a lot you know honestly if you're a young guy getting into it paint one on yeah uh, a mustache and actually Kyle and Ryan know a lot about mustaches. They do. So they, I'm sure, would attest to that. So Kyle and Ryan, just because we like you guys, you got seven tips there. Um, we're only <laughs> supposed to give you three, but beers are flowing, and we had lots of tips. So um, I tell you what, this was a lot of fun. I wish we could get more engagement when we do these, and I hope that maybe Hopefully this is— Hopefully it'll be a thing. Maybe this is on. a trendsetter. We're going to get more people calling in— or responding in because i think doing podcasts on the, the stuff that people want is uh makes it a lot more fun for us <laughs> really i just needs yeah cool. my first sneeze on the podcast 65 episodes in congratulations you made it's it all downhill long. from here <laughs> uh oh, i love sneezes that what were we so talking good. about uh just that i liked that we had that many oh, yeah. engagements yeah um that never happens and i'm very grateful for it yeah i'm i definitely dig it a lot like it honestly it if builds we could get to, our conversation if, yeah, a if lot we better. could get if i could get i would have those every single week yeah me too it'd be amazing so maybe we'll yeah, that's what we'll do we'll just monday morning post what do you guys want to hear Shoot from the hip. What do you guys want? <laughs> Shoot from the hip. Doesn't even have to be outdoors anymore. What do you yeah, want? We're just talking. So we started the podcast talking about St. Patty's Day. So we'll just yeah. whatever holiday you want this to talk is our about. Show. <laughs> we run um, this. Also, I do want to. So this is jumping back to last week. Um, we talked about uh, the Bruce Buffer uh, tethered uh, release. Uh, just, I like how you said Bruce Buffer first. Then yeah, because that's it, the it, more well, important it's part. It's because his was good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm seeing a lot of negative things about the tethered one sticks. Hmm. Uh, not the not the release. The release has been amazing. <laughs> Nothing Promo, negative there. Top notch. Um, but there's a lot of guys getting their sticks now for the Probably first time because of the Bruce Buffer video. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah they, I bet it sold a lot of product. <laughs> and it's been a lot of. I haven't seen anything good from anybody that's not paid. Like huh. pro staff is saying, it's great. Um, well, we're but, not getting paid, so we can no. say whatever we want. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to say that they're bad because I haven't tried them. Just what um, we hear. But I've watched this, some reviews from trusted people that made me look at it. So basically, like the one stick is held on, like the the steps. I was just gonna say the one stick, but that's the name of the stick too. Uh, <laughs> the steps are held in by a roll pin and a chemical bonding, which is a fancy word for glue. Yes. Um. Yeah, that's all I'm gonna say about that. It's like a hundred and twenty dollar stick, held together with Elmer's glue, <laughs> chemical bond. <laughs> like, I hated that they said that it was chemically bonded. It's yeah, glue. It's glue. So, with that being said, Bruce Buffer's badass. Um, check some reviews before you buy. I don't want to tell you not to buy. Just make sure you do your homework before you buy some product. Yeah. And that goes for any product. Don't just shoot from the hip. Um, don't speak, follow our example. Speaking of product, um. We're giving away a mobile setup. 
I, that was a beautiful segue. That was, uh, yeah, it was really something. Yeah, we're, it's your choice. Uh, and the gear that we're giving away is all been tested by us, trusted individuals. Um, anything that we're giving away, it's, it's brand new. We're giving away brand new stuff out of the box, drop shipped right to your door. We could give you our stuff if you wanted. Yeah, if you want, I'll sign it. <laughs> but could be uh, worth like ups the value a little bit but of money we, someday. We're giving away USA made stuff that we've used, like we've used those products. We Field know that tested by the White Cat crew. Yeah. So you can trust us with a quality brand. Like I said, it's USA made. Come on. Yeah. Lifetime warranty on anything that we're giving out. So, so go sign up for the Patreon. Yeah. yeah. Jump in there. A few spots left. Can't believe you haven't done it already. 17 yeah. cents a day. Yeah. I Thank can't you, Tom. stand. I wasn't even going to say it this <laughs> week, but I appreciate Tom for jumping in. Um, 17 cents. So I guess that leaves with just one last thing to do. And we just have to tell the folks to get outside. <laughs>